today's webinar, Nutritional Management of Spring Lambing Merinos to Rear More Lambs. This webinar is brought to you by Leading Sheep, which is a partnership between the Queensland Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Australian Wool Innovation and AgForce. My name is Nicole Salua and I am a Sheep Extension Officer based in Charleville and I will be your facilitator today. Your presenter is Dr John Milton. John is an Associate Professor at the University of of Western Australia and directs his own feed analysis and consultancy company, Independent Lab Services. John was born and raised in Queensland on a sheep and cattle property near Roma. However, most of his career has been spent in Western Australia working to help improve the sheep and lamb, in, sheep and lamb industries over there. In 2010, John was one of the 100 people named in the inaugural role of honour of the Australian sheep and lamb industry for his work as a researcher and innovator on the nutritional management of sheep. John's forte is to make science happen and we will see this in action today. So today John will be covering information on managing made and used, pregnancy scanning, the importance of ewe nutrition during pregnancy and lactation and particularly for twin bearing ewes. So I will now hand over to John. Hi folks, as Carl already said, we're going to speak today on nutritional management of spring lambing merino ewes to rear more lambs. The key focus here is to rear more lambs. The first thing if we want to rear more lambs, we've got to kick those maidens into gear. They've got to start earning their keep. So we want maidens rearing more lambs. First to get, firstly, to do this, we've got to get more maidens pregnant. And how can we help achieve that? The initial thing is they have to be sexually mature. And sexually mature, sexual maturity is more related to mature weight than age. However, by the spring, uh, sorry, by the autumn uh, of the spring, after the, uh, the previous um, spring when they were born, they will be, uh, well, two springs back, will be, they will be 18 months old. But they need to be at least 70% of mature weight. I found this is one of the things that's let many people down with their maidens. They're just not big enough and they need to be in good condition and that gold standard, that benchmark condition score 3 certainly applies to them. So the, if they're big enough, they're in the breeding season because you're mating for a spring lambing. So they're in the breeding season, so they've got everything going for them to get in lamb. So that's their job and that's what they should get on with. But you can't handicap them. Don't have them losing condition during joining. Losing condition is life-threatening, essentially. So why would they want to take on a parasite when they're already trying to grow themselves and they're losing weight? So consequently, you must hold up their condition uh, for that at least a 35-day a, a mating. I'm not an advocate of long mating. If anything, I go for short mating. But in this case, certainly they need two cycles. Join the maiden separate from the mature ewes. There's a number of reasons for this, is that oestrus is often shorter in maidens than mature ewes. It can be as short as half the length of time. So the rams, the ewes are in, in, available for mating for a shorter period. They're receptive to the ram for a shorter time and so we don't want those rams spending their time with the mature ewes when they should be working on those maiden ewes, so separate them for joining. Some maidens don't even seek out the rams. They're in oestrus, they're ovulated, they're in oestrus, 
and they won't seek out the rams. Our work here at UWA has shown that uh, with our temperament group, that our maiden ewes, um, some of our maiden ewes with a poor temperament didn't seek out the rams and consequently didn't get in lambs. Um, so we've established that fact. And there's a lot of, a lot of anecdotal evidence from uh, past uh, graziers certainly to, to, to attest to that, that some ewes don't seek out rams. And the other thing is, as I said, that time, the shorter easters, the mature ewes will often hog the rams. And um, they like to capitalise on those rams and uh, because they're in easters longer, and some of them are more than twice as long as easters as, um, as, as, as the maidens. Now once you've got those maidens that you've scanned them pregnant, you need to manage them as well because you've got to give them adequate feed for fetal, for their fetal growth and their own body growth. They're still growing so they need that, they need good nutrition and hold them around that score three. I know it can be difficult but that is the standard and there's quite good, there's a lot of good evidence to support that score three. Generally your maidens will only have a single, which is good from that point of view, but they need to have it and rear it. So don't overfeed them. We don't want too big a lambs in there. Um, and um, there's been work showing sometimes if your maidens are overfed, you can actually induce um, a smaller lambs. So their chances of survival are a lot less. So there's two, two sides to that coin. I don't think the experiment's been done in the critical experiment's been done in merinos but certainly work overseas in crossbreds has shown, in British breeds has shown, overfeeding led to small lambs. My experience with many of my clients has not been the case, um, and, um, but basically we've got to get that maiden up to a good weight so that she can then um, carry herself through pregnancy and through lactation. So she's got a serious job to do and we've got to make sure she's well prepared and capable of doing it and certainly with a little bit of uh, fat on her back as well, and that score three means that she has got some. The other point about maidens is that we should slam them separate from their mature ewes. So they basically manage all the way separate. A big issue here is lamb stealing. A maiden has never had a lamb before, and it's quite well established that um, at all times, ewes find placenta quite, or after birth, quite repugnant. But on the point of lambing, they actually are attracted to the placenta. And if we've got mature ewes lambing with maiden ewes, and a maiden lamb is on the point of lambing, and the mature ewe is attracted to her by her placenta, uh, or she's lambed, and, uh, and, and uh, the mature ewe, she's on the point of lambing, she's got maternal instincts kicking in for, in her brain, and so she will steal that lamb before the maiden gets a chance to even turn around and probably suckle it. Because the maiden has never had a lamb before, and she probably gets a bit of a fright or whatever, I've never been able to ask the sheep, oh, the next language you've got to learn is, is to learn to speak sheep. The bottom line to this slide though, ladies and gentlemen, is that lambs from maidens have the best genetics. So if you want to make genetic gain in your business, in your sheep business, in your merino sheep business, then you have to have maidens having lambs and plenty of them and rearing them. The next point I want to emphasise is scanning. Scanning to me is nearly a no-brainer. You just do it. And not just scan for zero. It's, nice. it's unfortunate to know you've got those drives, but sometimes we can turn that into a positive because at least you know what you've got. So if you scan for drives, singles and twins or um, two plus in those older parity use because we know some of those, if they've had a good season at mating, at joining, if the conditions have been good and they've been in good order, then some of them on their third or fourth lambs will have tri uh, triplets. Uh, they will need to be managed accordingly, but certainly twins are more the norm um, for those uh, use. So why do we want to scan? Well, there's many reasons to scan. 
And the first is so that the feed resources aren't wasted on dries. If you're facing a tough season and you've come through a tough season of joining, you've probably got a lot of dries. Because if the ewes, particularly if the season didn't start well and the ewes were losing condition during joining, you're probably going to have a lot of dries and you won't have many twins. So you want to be able to uh, use that knowledge as a tool for the management of those sheep, uh, whether you run those dries as, well as, as weathers and just get their wool cut is the option. That's the beauty of the merino, is that she does, does produce wool as well as lamb, as well as meat, uh, and certainly we can um, uh, get money for that wool. So manage it, and you can even manage the micron a little bit, running them as, 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 uh, as weather. <clears throat> the second point here is that the, the ewes with singles and twins need to be managed differentially. We manage them so the feed can meet the need. We have to have the feed meeting the need, and this is critical for the twinners, especially in late pregnancy and lactation. You could even scan the twinners into cycles one and two for paddock management and feeding at lambing, especially if you're using those uh, using lick feeders as a as a tool, as a labour saving tool, and, and and avoid having to disrupt the ewes at lambing. Lick feeders have a valuable role there, but you if you often you don't have enough because you need to lamb those twinners in small paddocks and in small mobs, because you don't want large mobs of them on top of each other at the, at the lick feeder at the point of lambing because you'll end up with a lot of lamb stealing and mismothering and unfortunately a lot of dead lambs can happen. So that management is absolutely critical and so having those paddocks lined up uh, or having the ewes lined up according to their, their um, time in, of, of lambing, uh, knowing their cycles. It does take a bit of experience to scan them into cycles. Um, so basically I get my guys to call big and small fetuses uh, amongst the twins and that's how I age them. Okay, so it's just on size. Once they've got a perception of how their how the overall size is, and they got okay. So a, an important point that is 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 uh, often overlooked, and it's pretty logical. Ewes with twins need to have two good teats if they're going to rear the twins. So it's a bit hard with the, uh, the well, you can't do it the day way they scan the old way of scanning uh, when we pull them out on the board. Um, is a lot different and they, the, the two teats were facing it or the udder was facing it so we can soon identify if you didn't have two teats if you're quick enough or you had a good scanner but now with, uh, along the race scanning um, uh, underneath it's uh, a little bit more difficult so it's a special job but uh, if they know they're twinners then you, uh, if they got, haven't got two teats or if they've got bottle teats as you know those older ewes can have bottle teats and they'll lose their lambs the lambs can't get their mouths around the teats what scanning does, ladies and gentlemen, it informs you what you've got to manage, what you've got on, what your sheep have on board that you have to manage, and then you can plan to manage them. My view is that failing to plan is planning to fail when it comes to management of livestock. Again, we're reinforcing this condition score three during pregnancy. We need good we need that condition score uh, three during pregnancy to achieve good placental growth. The placenta is the conduit of the nutrients. It sets up all the pipes that are going to carry nutrients to those fetus, to the fetus, to the fetuses. And so we need to set up a good placenta. And the placenta does most of its growth in the first 90 days of pregnancy. And so that's one of the reasons, once we know who's got what on board, we need to ensure, or who's pregnant, we need to ensure we get a good percentile growth because that will have an outcome on lamb birth weights. And we know lamb birth weights are related to survival. So all these things are linked. We know from a lot of, a lot of work over the years that more, you've got more lambs to rear if the ewes are held in condition score two and a half to three versus two. I know the standard's three, but we know that a lot of those singles, probably, if things are tough, are going to be left to manage at a score two and a half, uh, but keep three certainly in mind for those twinners and try and achieve it. Uh, work has shown that we may rear up to 20% more twins if we use lamb in condition score three 
or higher versus a lower condition score. Basically, a rise in condition one condition score can give you up to 20% more twins being reared. So that, that's all good reasons to learn how to condition score and then try your utmost to manage the, manage the animals or manage your feed resources to ensure that they are kept around that score three. You'll get the higher clean fleece weights from the lambs that are reared from the ewes that are, higher, that are kept around that high that condition score three. If, uh, it might be a little bit broader in micron, but you've got the live lamb, uh, which is possibly the consequence of that. He's going to cut more wool in his life, and it's permanent. You don't lose it. It's permanent. And, um, and, and, and it, even though the micron might be a little bit broader. Here we must regularly condition score our sheep to assess them. We need to assess them if the feed is meeting the need. It is a tool that tells us how the body energy status of the sheep is responding to the feed that it's consuming, whether it's uh, out of the paddock, out of a supplement, or whatever. But it's telling us the energy status is either responding up or down. So is the feed meeting the need? And it will also allow us to assess whether we need to lift or lower the feed supply. Often we need to lift the feed supply or the quality of the feed, basically move them to a better paddock, um, move them to a paddock that's been spelled, um, or in the case of um, ewes getting a bit too over-conditioned because you haven't got enough sheep and the season's running well, then you might need to tighten the paddock up um, and tight so they don't blow out, uh, blow their blow out in condition. Condition scoring, you've got to get your hands on them because the fingers can feel what the wool marks. You can often see uh, what sort of condition ewes are in as they're walking off the shearing board, but uh, that's not all year round, so you've got to get your fingers on their back, your hands on the back, and um, the tool, very cheap, very cheap, one of the cheapest management tools you've got attached to the end of your arm. So we've got the lambs on board. We know we've got a lot of twins, but we know there are, can be problems. We aren't there yet. We're a long way from the money. And we know to rear more lambs, we need to reduce the loss of twins around birth. People say, well, I, you know, I just like singles. Well, if you're getting 90% lambing out of sing as, as single lambs, you're not going to make a lot of. You're not going to have a lot of animals if you if, you're there, if that's fine. If you are getting that, but you're always going to have some twins, particularly in good years. And so you've got to learn. We've got to work out ways to manage them. We've got to find ways to better management. And I've had the privilege and pleasure working in this area for a number of years with some wonderful students who've made some major breakthroughs in this area. And I'm going to share with them, share those with you now. Uh, our group here at UWA has been working in this area along with our French colleagues for nearly 30 odd years and I think we, well, we have made progress. Um, merino ewes often lose their lambs or may lose their lambs soon after birth, their twin lambs soon after birth. Often the cause is desertion. Now we know that colostrum can play a role to reduce these losses. And the key is that the ewe must have runny colostrum so the lambs can suck within the first hour of birth. First hour after birth, they must get up and suck. We know from our research that some twin bearers have no colostrum or only pasties colostrum for up to six hours after birth. And consequently, the result is going to be twins will be lost around the time of birth. Well, how can we increase this colostrum production to reduce the loss of twin lambs? Our work has shown that a large increase in nutrient intake in the last week of pregnancy reduces the level of pregnancy, uh, progesterone, the hormone of pregnancy, the hormone that maintains the integrity of the uterine wall to keep it all together. But also, this hormone blocks the enzymes that are responsible for lactogenesis or colostrogenesis, that is the formation of colostrum, particularly lactose. So lactose is the sugar in the milk which has the osmotic 
pool, uh, exerts an osmotic pull in the milk, in the colostrum or the milk. Now, the progesterone blocks the synthesis of that um, lactose. And so, if we can reduce the level of progesterone in the blood quickly, this will facilitate the onset of colostrum production. So the ewe will have colostrum, an artery full of colostrum at birth when, the, when she lands. We know that if extra glucose is available for colostrum synthesis just before lambing, the ewe will accumulate a lot of runny colostrum in the udder for the newborn lambs to suck. Now, the, constant, the thing is I talked about lactose, the milk sugar. Once the lactose is formed in the milk from the glucose from the blood, then that then pulls the liquid in to make the volume of colostrum a lot larger, but along with it come all the other goodies that are in colostrum. So you don't end up just with a watery colostrum, you end up with a big volume of good quality colostrum. Admittedly, the immunoglobulin is a bit more diluted because, as I'll show you, that volume can be increased markedly. So how can we achieve all this? We're achieving a number of physiological responses in the animal, so how can we feed it, achieve it? We feed a large supplement in the week before lambing to give the ewes a lot of glucose and some extra protein. This isn't, story isn't finished yet, it's unfinished business. We've got a lot, we know there's uh, other supplements we can probably use. We've got some very interesting results. Uh, and um, so uh, keep, watch this space, I suppose, the thing to say. Here's the work that really kicked it off. Uh, this is the work of, Ban uh, of Georgette Banchiro. Um, um, Georgette um, did her PhD with me uh, and Dave Lindsay here at UWA and Graham Martin. And uh, uh, unfortunately, she thought she was coming to work with the gurus, but she got stuck with me. And um, so uh, she was had given up a scholarship to go to New Zealand and. Uh, came work with us, so we had a big responsibility for Georgette, and she turned out to be a wonderful student and a very dear friend. Um, colostrum, in this slide, what we're showing is corn or barley as a supplement to a basal diet. You'll see down the left side the treatments were cracked corn. Uh, just need to preface the fact that we now don't use cracked corn. The sheep have got a very good hammer mill in their head to crack the corn. We do still use whole barley, but you'll see the massive increase in colostrum production. 229 grams, 292, say 300 grams to 600 grams, you like, doubled it, okay, by feeding those uh, extra, that extra feed, extra feed, I must emphasize, of about 600 grams of, of, of each of those grains. If we look at the viscosity, that is the, the runniness of the colostrum, on the basal diet, we scored them one to seven. One is peanut butter, seven is runny milk, virtually, or runny colostrum, very runny colostrum, just like milk. And you'll see the basal diet, 4.3, but the note to point here, the point to note here, is the large variation, the CV, the coefficient of variation, 42%. So there were some ewes had pretty runny um, uh, colostrum, others peanut butter. But when we fed the corn and the barley, they, that CV came right down. The viscosity went, uh, was markedly reduced, so it became much more runny. And the CV, so all the ewes had runny colostrum, or a bigger proportion, a much greater proportion. To, uh, the, you know, we've gone from 42% CV to 15, 16. We also, so here we've achieved the objective to get that plenty of runny colostrum. Here we can see a slight increase in the birth weight, not significant, but biologically would be of significance. The 300 gram and the 600 gram birth weight in a single at three and a half, or a twin at three and a half kilos is biologically important. So the conclusion to this um, process, this strategy, is we use corn or barley um, as an extra feed, extra feed. In the fire, you're, you're feeding them according to their requirements for pregnancy. So you feed them corn or barley as an extra feed in the final week of pregnancy to increase the amount of runny colostrum available to the twins at birth and with a slight lift in their birth weight. So we're getting this slight lift in their birth weight, 
but we've got heaps of runny colostrum as well for these heavy little tacker, heavier little tackers to get hold of and suck. Um, so it, bottom line here, we've got more runny colostrum in the udder of lambing, allows those twin lambs to get adequate colostrum to meet their needs for energy, antibodies and water. Now people always talk about, oh, you've got to get their colostrum to get their antibodies. Yes, very true. But they've got at least 12 hours to get those antibodies. But if they're not with their mum, they won't get any and they'll, they'll die, they'll perish. Okay, so they need, they need energy, they need their antibodies and they need water, particularly in a hot environment because being a young animal, they're probably over 80, around 80% 80 water and they will desiccate very quickly, they'll dehydrate very quickly. So all those points said, said, I think the most important part here, and as I've said, furthermore, by the ewe suckling her lamb soon after birth, the ewe lamb bond is strengthened. We have to dive into a bit of neurophysiology here, but essentially it is a, a quite a fascinating process. Um, and the, so how do we strengthen that? ewe lamb bond, if we've got that ewe lamb bond strengthened, both lambs are more likely to follow the ewe when she moves off the birth site. So the outcome is more ewes rearing twins, which is what we want. Now just going back a little bit on that neurophysiology, um, the, the, the suckling process, that actual suckling, um, what happens, I talked about that you on the birth site, uh, sorry, that you uh, at the time of lambing um, coming up to the, being attracted to the placenta and that's all part of this, uh, this surge in maternal bond or surge in the maternal sites in the brain. The stretching of the, of the birth canal on the point of lambing stimulates the birth site, birth, uh, the maternal sites in the brain so that you then wants to be a mother. She wants to take a lamb and that's why she'll steal a lamb. Okay, and that's why we see all the, the behaviour of those ewes around the point of lambing. Um, now, the, the, that maternal bonding, or the, sorry, that maternal stimulation of the maternal uh, instinct or, uh, or the maternal sites in the brain to, to, bring, uh, to elicit the instinct is brought about by a hormone, the hormone oxytocin. But it's oxytocin actually secreted inside the brain. It's not oxy, if you gave oxytocin injection, it wouldn't do it. It has to be inside the brain to stimulate those maternal sites. But what happens is when that ewe suckles those, sucks, suckles those lambs, with that, it's now sucking that runny colostrum, that stimulates the um, posterior pituitary to secrete oxytocin for the milk letdown response. And when that oxytocin is released, the, the squeeze that sque uh, squeezes the smooth muscles and pushes the colostrum into the milk system, and the lambs are sucking away there, and then the little tail engages, and you know that the show's underway. But there's other things happening. That the the oxytocin uh, is soon cleared from the blood, but as the posterior to pituitary is filling up again with oxytocin being secreted back into the it leaks back inside the brain and that stimulates the maternal sites again and again. So each time she's suckling, she's reinforcing that maternal bonding. So the key is to get that first suckle, to get that lamb suckling and taking in that runny colostrum. And um, so uh, the other part is that the lamb also plays a role by the sheer fact that he actually uh, suckles, uh, sucks, the suckling and our colleagues in France, Raymond Novak has done work just giving them water and then they will, they will suckle more. It, it, uh, so the actual uh, suckling reflex uh, in the lamb has an effect. And the story gets even more exciting because it's been shown from some work in Poland that colostrum actually has a, um, a, a compound in it which has a cognitive property, it's called clostinin. And there's been some work done, interestingly, with some Alzheimer's patients. So bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, if you see me as an old bloke around, following old user around, and they said he's lost his marbles, 
I might be onto that story. Okay. Um, anyhow, the bottom line to all this with this colostrum strategy is we need more ewes rearing, rearing those twins. We've got to grow our lambs out to achieve their genetic potential. They must achieve their genetic potential for both body growth and wool growth. And that, once we've got those live lambs on the ground, is going to be certainly in the first three or four weeks is going to be up to their mother. Okay, so we've now got them bonded uh, and we're going to, the mother will need to be well fed so that she's got a large intake of metabolizable energy. Basically just think of energy that makes things go, protein makes things grow. So she needs a large intake of metabolizable energy. How large? Well, it's about three times the ME intake required just for maintenance. So up to about day 70 of pregnancy, that maintenance requirement of the U is the same as a dry U, or very similar to a dry U. And basically, um, if it was, say, for a, um, uh, a 70 kilo, a six, sorry, a 60 kilo U, sorry, it's around about um, eight megajoules a day she needs, um, walking around the paddock, keeping her upright, that's for maintenance, keep her organs ticking over, harvesting the food, digesting the food. Maintenance must be met before we get production. But once we get production, as in a lactating ewe, that energy requirement, that metabolism energy requirement, will be about threefold in a twin-bearing ewe, for a twin-bearing ewe to, to produce enough milk to sustain good growth rates in those lambs. So she needs that large intake of energy, ME, and it's about three times. She will mobilize some fat if she's in good order, um, and now another good reason to have them in score three, so they've got a bit of fat to mobilise and that will help meet the energy requirement, but it, it certainly um, won't go um, reduce it to anywhere near uh, that maintenance level. So it's certainly, you generally, a rule of thumb, you can say two and a half times to three times um, uh, maintenance requirement for energy for lactating use. She needs protein. That doesn't need to be overly done. Um, 11, 12% protein in their diets, probably more than adequate. Um, but she, because she's uh, now she's got, got rid of her lambs, they're on the ground, uh, they're following her instead of her carrying them around. She's got plenty of room in her stomach, uh, plenty of room in her rumen so she can eat uh, a lot of feed and uh, so she can get the protein intake that way. Also, she can get the energy intake that way, but she's going to need, again, because it's such a large increase in energy, she needs a reasonable concentration of ME in the diet. They need their essential minerals. As you know, we're all told that you've got to have you know, calcium for milk. But they also need phosphorus. Phosphorus is, is involved in all energy transformations in the body, so they need adequate phosphorus for um, uh, the, the, uh, for, to, 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 for the ewe to synthesize that milk, to assimilate the components of the milk. Uh, and as well as her own uh, maintenance. But so phosphorus is involved in all energy transformations in the body. And I think it's uh, everyone gets a bit carried away with calcium. In fact, calcium can impact on phosphorus availability. Um, but it, it, it certainly, phosphorus can be something that is overlooked. And I think it has been overlooked in many par parts of, the, of Australia, uh, particularly in sheep. Okay, We know it's important in cattle, but it, it is also important in sheep certainly in lactating sheep and young growing animals where they've got a high energy requirement and they need to metabolize uh, a lot of nutrients. I've got roughage in there. They certainly need roughage and down the slide you'll find out why. So I say plus roughage. They can eat a lot of roughage because they've got room now in their stomach. They need all these goodies to produce that big volume of milk with the adequate levels of protein, lactose, minerals, and fat. And one of the points about the fiber is fiber ferments to acetate, the first of the volatile fatty acids, which are a major energy source in ruminants. Okay? They're fermented in the rumen, and acetate is basically vinegar. Uh, it ferments to, as a fiber, 
is fermented to mainly acetate, and acetate is used for fat synthesis in the body. And merino milk, is in the, in, um, yeah, merino milk is up to nine percent fat. We've done, we've had we've done a lot of, well, not me, but colleagues here at UWA have um, had experiments, a lot of experiments milking ewes, and merino milk certainly is very high in fat, probably because the volume is lower, but certainly up to nine percent fat. So it's a very good energy source for the lambs. That fat, remembering is that uh, that fat is probably at least two and a quarter times the energy value of carbohydrates and protein. It is important. So we need that fibre in the diet to produce acetate to produce fat. And particularly if you use aren't in good order at lactation, if they've got down on you in lactation, they will need to early lactation when they're really milking off their back as well. They peak, peak lactation about three weeks. If they're really hitting their straps and they're in dropped in condition down around score two, they will need that fat uh, because that acetate being produced because they're not um, not mobilising a lot of fat from their back. Okay, they haven't got it there to mobilise. They're different um, chain link fatty acids. The uh, acetate is mainly used for short chain fatty acids, but still it is important to have that adequate fibre to meet that fat, which is the a good energy source for those lambs. Also, roughage fills the ewes up. Okay, it keeps those ewes filled up. It keeps them contented. They're down chewing their cud. Right? Lying down, chewing their cud, working on that fibre, uh, filling up, filled up and quite contented. That's very important. You know, the ad for the, ad for the carnation milk from contented cows, well, here we've got to have contented sheep. Another point which has been um, pushed in some other areas uh, is, 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 is in enhancing room and development in the lambs. And I, th I think this is something that um, really has to be done uh, and has to be, has to be considered more. Um, and if you are hand feeding and you are feeding grains, certainly you will, uh, are provided you've got fibre there that the lambs are getting access to, you will get more um, it will get uh, with the what, the NSC stands for non-structural carbohydrates. So this is the starches and the sugars in the feed. Now a lot of your feeds do have sugars, um, and uh, particularly when they're actively photosynthesizing, uh, and uh, that is green. Obviously, um, if you get rain on your dry pasture, a lot of those sugars are leached, um, and so your non-structural carbohydrates are important along with the fibre. And, uh, to enhance that rumen development in the lamb, to enhance that um, uh, musculature of the rumen, but more importantly, the absorptive surface, that put those papillae, stimulating papillae development. And there's some very interesting um, photographs if someone wants to Google into uh, into Penn State University on on, on, the, on that subject on on um, on calves, on enhancing rumen development. And the last point here, but not the least, and uh, is and, and, and needs to be uh, uh, emphasised, is that lactating ewes need a good supply of quality water. They do need that good supply of milk, even though it's got nine percent. It's probably at least eighty-five percent water, um, and so they've got to have that good supply of quality water to meet their large demand for milk production. Some of these ewes will be producing two and a half, three litres of milk uh, for twins. We don't see it until we take the lambs off um, and take the lambs away, but uh, one, you, 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 because the lambs are always at the milk bar and, and removing that milk. But th those others, particularly um, you know, if, you, if they're well fed and they're well, they, they've been stimulated, those ewes will have very good udders, so there's a lot of milk being produced and a big part of it the greater part of it is water, so they've got to have quality water. And of course that means uh, water that's not high in salt, so you've got to dedicate that better water and um, thinking about the management of your paddocks to those ewes that are that lactating. Okay? Um, I, I put this last one in particularly for, for Queensland because I think it's, and, and um, my clients uh, in, the, in the northwest have certainly uh, found that quality bush hay can be a very useful roughage. Mitchell Flinders grass, curling barley Mitchells and Flinders grasses, probably not the bull Mitchell, but those sort of grasses um, 
you know, you do get good seasons. You had a few of them a little while back after a number of years of treacherous seasons. But when you get those good years, that's when you need to put that, that hay away. Probably get it before it's uh, fully set seed. Um, uh, and um, you can cut it then. It won't be overly high in protein, 7% maybe at the best. Probably 8.5 megs, 9, I don't think you get out for 9 megs, what I've analysed of it. But it can be a valuable, useful source of roughage. Um, and uh, the thing is, in, 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 in early pregnancy, up to around about that day 80, uh, 70, 80 of pregnancy, irrespective of whether they've got twins or singles on board, they don't need much more than maintenance. And if you've got eight, eight and a half megs of energy and you can stimulate that protein a little bit more with a lick or something like that, you can maintain those ewes in early pregnancy. Um, Middly, as they advance in pregnancy, their demands, and I'll touch a little bit on this before I wind up, um, their, their demands in pregnancy, particularly in late pregnancy, uh, where the fetus is making the most rapid growth, they're definitely going to need good quality feed there. They're going to need that higher ME intake. Um, it rises about two to two and a half megajoules uh, for a twin above a single because of the fetal growth, the rapid growth of those fetuses in the last part of pregnancy. So you can, your highs can be valuable up to the early, in the early stages of pregnancy, but later on they've got to have either quality feed uh, or, or supplements, and that's certainly going to have to include some grain um, or your cotton seeds, uh, fuzzy cotton seed, those sort of products. Um, but here uh, the, 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 the simple thing is, that she's got in late pregnancy, the last six weeks, she's got that high nutrient demand and she physically can't fit the food in. They physically can't fit the fibre in um, because they, to put it a little bit crudely, they've got a gut full of lambs pushing on the rumen. And it's that actual gut full of lambs pushing on the rumen is part of the strategy that kicks the grain out of the rumen for the colostrum strategy, pushes it out so it's not fermented in the rumen. Um, so that they physically can't um, digest, uh, oh, sorry, uh, handle that large quantity, large bulk of feed, so they've got to have a more concentrated feed to meet that nutrient demand um, of that high nutrient demand, particularly for glucose, for that rapid growth of the fetuses. And um, so consequently, um, you know, you've got to go to more concentrate feeds at that stage. If we can pull up there. Thank you, John. That was that was excellent. So we'd like to spend the next little while answering your questions about some of the things that John has spoken about in terms of feeding and managing your ewes so they have the best possible chance of rearing their lambs. So while you're thinking about the questions you would like to ask or typing these questions into the question box, I would just like to remind you to fill out our short survey to give us some feedback on this webinar. So you can either click on the link in the question or chat box uh, which you should see in front of you, or you should have an email sitting in your inbox right now from me with a link to the survey in it as well. So John, we do have a number of questions already typed in, so I will just um, just start reading them out to you and um, we'll just go through those. Uh, but if, if you do have a, any other questions and you'd like to raise your hand, I, I can unmute you and you can ask your question yourself of John as too. So. Starting with the first question, John, uh, I think it goes back to the, the very first slide that you had up. Can you elaborate on why maidens have the best genetics? Well, they should have your best genetics because they're the young animals. And if you've been buying better rams every year, they're the female progeny from those rams that should be carrying your best genetics. If you're not, you're not on a genetic path, I presume. Does that answer the question? I, well, I think so, so that's good. Uh, next question, is there a link between magnesium and improved colostrum production through calcium immobilisation from the bone? No, colostrum has calcium. It has magnesium. Calcium is quite rich, uh, sorry, colostrum is quite rich in, um, in, uh, in minerals. Um, it's rich in everything, vitamins, minerals, the whole lot antibodies, because that's where the lambs get their antibodies. But um, 
certainly the ewes need to mobilise calcium um, uh, and some and some calcium. Uh, sorry. Uh, to meet that requirement for uh, at the onset of colostrum formation. Um, they also um, will absorb calcium, but their absorption might be reduced if they got gut stasis around the uh, time of lambing. Um, but uh, along when calcium comes out of bone, which is the major reserve of calcium, or magnesium, which is a lesser um, mineral in the bone, and also phosphorus. So they're all coming out. Um, to, to think it has, I don't believe it has a, well, our understanding, I'd have to say, is that um, uh, the, the um, colostrum is largely driven by, uh, colostrum production is largely driven by uh, the precursors and particularly um, lactose. Um, as, as being the uh, osmotic driver for that because colostrum doesn't start to form until that lactose actually can be formed. Um, and so that's where the progesterone is blocking it. So magnesium, magnesium is more involved, in, um, more involved in, in nervous function actually. Um, and um, also uh, there has been a bit of a push of, of late to, you know, and I think um, obviously magnesium um, it can be important along with some other elements in terms of um, um, parturition, in terms of pushing out the fetus, the good muscle tone, good uterine tone. There seems to be some suggestions of that. Um, but calcium is critical for muscle, um, muscle contraction. It's a major iron involved in muscle contraction. So all those things are all part of it. Um, so um, no, I, I wouldn't say directly. Um, Indirectly, maybe, um, have heard in cattle that magnesium has been involved in uh, retained placentas. That could help, could be a little bit uh, in play um, in the, uh, until those um, um, cotyledons un uncouple and the, and the, um, and the uh, placenta is cleared, the placenta is still producing progesterone and could be holding up the progesterone. So maybe magnesium could play a role there. Um, given, you know, I'm sort of doing a bit of largely um, extrapolation here, but um, I, I haven't come across any real direct effect. If, if uh, I'd love, to, you know, if there is if there is some literature suggested uh, or indicates that it does happen, I'd love to hear about it. Thanks. Is that adequate, Nicole? Yep. No, that was good. We've got a couple of questions about the um, the table that you put up. So, do you want to go right. back to that? So, so the first one is how can one week of feeding affect birth weight so much? Because the fetus at that time is making most rapid growth. The point I finished on in the, uh, when we were talking on the last slide, the fetus is, is absolutely roaring this, and you've got two of them. And so we've finally met their requirements and they demand glucose. If muscle, don't forget when a fetus is born or when the lamb is born, it's a lot of a lot of protein, a lot of water, a little bit of brown fat, some fat. Um, but um, and so what we've done to assimilate protein and put all those goodies together, so we end up with a lamb. Um, they need glucose, and that's what we're supplying. So we're meeting that requirement. But also we are supplying protein as well. So that's why we get this increase, but not over the top. Um, I reckon that's a, 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 so if you, yeah, I reckon that is a, you know, it, it is biologi of biological significance. Put it this way, I think it would influence the, the ability of a, a 4.1 kilo lamb would have a, a better survivability than a three and a half kilo lamb if you've got bad chill factors and that sort of thing, bad cold rainy weather. And uh, Georgette's subsequent work has shown the blood glucose levels of these lambs are that uh, have received, the mothers who have received the supplements their blood glucose levels are much higher. So they're, they're actually got a ready energy available, a readily, so readily, a readily available source of energy to get up and suckle. So they get up and suckle a lot quicker. And uh, that work's been published also in the, um, along with a lot of this work in the uh, Animal Consortium Journal in Europe. Does that answer oh, that part? Yep, no, that was, that was good. Um, 
we've got a couple of questions here which are quite similar. So, and and they're asking about um, besides corn and barley, is there anything else that that would do the job in the week before lambing? So we've got producers who feed things like lupins and and fava beans to pregnant and lactating ewes. So is there anything else that helps increase colostrum levels similar to corn and barley? Anything, and this is this is what I'd say. Where there's, oh, I've just had the power go off here, unfortunately. Just excuse me. I do apologise. I wasn't expecting that. It had, it had two days to go off in the bad weather. Um, the 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 um, other feed. Yeah. Besides corn or barley, is there anything else that might um, things like lupins and fava beans? Yeah, no, they lupins. Use? Lupins, no. Lupins have no starch. You've got to have starch. Fava beans do have starch. Fava beans is quite good. It's not over the top in starch. It's got a source of protein. Fibers are about 40% starch. Uh, they're safe, relatively safe. And but the beauty of corn is, corn actually is of all the cereal grains. It has the highest level of starch, but it also has a uh, a starch which is not readily fermented in the rumen. So that starch, if we can get it out of the rumen, um, then is 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 delivered to the small intestine where if we feed it ahead of time, so we build them up on the corn three or four days before that last week when we push it, um, then what happens is it induces the enzyme which digests starch, amylase, digests starch and releases glucose which is then absorbed. So we know it is glucose that you've got to get in there and um, you have to get glucose. It's convinced, it, we're, to, we're totally, we, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a, it's no argument. It is glucose that's driving it. So anything that will deliver glucose into the body uh, will uh, enhance colostrum. Now there's a couple of other ways it can be done, and uh, George has done some subsequent work which we published as well. That um, we and so let's just reiterate back on that lupins. No, that's where we all started from with George Hitt's work. It just didn't work, and that's why I had to reinvent the, the whole whole approach because um, we have a lot of lupins here and everyone reckons lupins had to work. Um, but we only got a 77% increase in, 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 in colostrum production with lupin. And the trouble was the lupin swelled up and the ewes then stopped eating. So that was a problem because um, they had a gut full of lambs and a gut full of swelled up lupins, uh, releasing, pumping out a lot of ammonia. So that's why you don't want a lot of soluble protein there because that um, stops glucose uptake into cells. But what we, what the other, so you've got fibers, they're fine. They're a big grain, which is good, uh, easy to feed out. Uh, got some protein, not over the top, probably reasonably degradable, but also got some starch. So fibers certainly, uh, we haven't done the work, but logically um, they should work. Um, uh, but going the other way, as I said, anything that delivers glucose. Now your proteins can all deliver glucose by what we call uh, deamination. The amino acids, uh, the proteins broken down in the small intestine, released, amino acids absorbed, and the amino acids can be stripped of the nitrogen and left with a carbon skeleton that actually can be used to synthesize glucose. So we call that gluconeogenesis, that process. Normally they get their glucose, ruminants normally get their glucose from propionate. I talked about acetate from fiber, well propionate the second, what we call the C3, um, so you've got methane, acetate C3, C2, propionate C3, butyrate C4. Um, and we all know about the problems with methane. So our, the challenge for us is to turn that C2, that C1 from methane, add it to acetate and produce propionate, because propionate, the C3, a volatile fatty acid, is the major glucogenic precursor. And so it drives glucose production uh, normally when feeds are fermented in the rumen. So they produce the uh, uh, propionate, propionate goes to the liver and convert it to glucose and meets the glucose demands of the animal. But here we've got around all that. That's a pretty inefficient way of doing it, but that's how rumens do it. But here we've got around it by delivering starch to the small intestine, inducing the enzyme that breaks down starch amylase and getting glucose that way. Or um, our work in Georgette's work in, in uh, that we've, that uh, the last one of the last papers published was uh, she actually fed um, 
uh, lotus pasture that had high, uh, quite high levels of tannins that would have protected the protein. There's more work to be done. We need to do some other experiments to absolutely prove it, but um, it's quite quite convincing that um, that and, and in fact compared to corn, a high a high intake of this lotus pasture with tannins, and we know the tannins reduce the solubility of the protein. So a lot more protein, there was a lot of protein being consumed from this pasture, this legume, sorry, and so a lot of protein would have been getting to the small intestine much more than their requirement, so it's quite likely they were breaking it down and producing glucose, deaminating some of it to produce glucose to meet the requirement, and we got a similar level of colostrum, increasing colostrum production as we did with corn. Now, just a little bit on an aside to that, Georgette's also done some work, showed that we know from all our team here at UWA that, uh, and, and our colleagues in various parts of the world that um, you actually, um, uh, if we can actually um, uh, get more glucose into the animal, we can stimulate ovulation rate. And uh, George just published a paper in the journal Animal Production Science, our Australian journal, um, here showing that um, feeding um, Tannin treated, uh, t um, sorry, soybean meal treated with tannin, so reducing, the, making more bypass protein, if you like, increased ovulation rate. So it was delivering glucose. So you know, if we, there's a few more critical experiments to be done. So we would would certainly think that feeding your bypass proteins in this stage of pregnancy, um, late pregnancy, could help. Um, certainly, you know, there's a fair evidence it will supply glucose, provided where their, their other their, their protein requirement is already being met. Right, sorry, I had to go into a bit of a biochemistry lecture, but um, it's you know it, it is, it's not a simple story. Um, but um, yeah, some of the the, the uh, high protein pellets that are around may well work just as well. But we haven't done the work. Thanks, John. We've got a couple of people with their hands up, so I'm going to go to them now. And so, uh, firstly, I'll um, in a minute I'll unmute John Hardy, and then I'll um, unmute Prue Barclays because both of those have got questions. So I'll unmute John. Um, and John, if you can hear us. Okay, <coughs> John, uh, did you say something about sulphur and water? <coughs> um, I just missed a bit there, and I'm just not sure what it was. Well, yes, if you've got a, you know, if you've got a, a bores with a fair bit of salt in them, like we have here in WA, um, well, you don't want a, a U with a high lactating, you know, a U lactating U on those sort of waters, because in hot, hot weather, it certainly can put them in a vicious cycle. They drink more, they drink sodium, they drink the water with the high level of sodium, then they get thirsty because sodium makes them thirsty, and then they need to drink more water, and they take in more sodium. So you stay away from those high salt bores um, during um, the, for lactating use. Does that clarify uh, we, that, John? We, uh, no, we thought it, we thought you said sulphur. Oh, sulphur? <laughs> no, it's sulphur. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, sulphur, sulphur you know, just makes the water smelly. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's. But yeah, no, no. Well, yeah, yeah. Certainly, when you get exceptionally, exceptionally high levels of sulphate sulphur, yes, you've got to be careful. Yep. Um, but look, I don't want to go into that. I'd be extrapolating across to some work on the my, um, pit waters out of the mines and around, uh, in the, uh, around Mara and that sort of thing, uh, where a young fellow did his PhD on years ago. Um, Thank you. It, yeah, so you can, you've got to watch really high sulphur levels. So obviously, sulphur is important for, and if you've got it in your water, which you know, like you know, there's H2S comes off the, the gas smell comes off a lot of the water out in the western parts of western in the parts of western Queensland. But um, whether that's a, that's already in an op, in a high, in a, um, a reduced form, it's hydrogen sulfide and it's got, it's volatiling off. But it, it's sulfate sulfur that some bugs in the room and use. And of course, the sulfur amino acids is what your wool is. So you do need a good supply of sulfur. Yes, that's what I thought. Okay, okay, but not over the top. Everything Thank you. in moderation, John. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'm going to unmute Prue Barkler because she's got her hand up as well. So, Prue, if you want to ask your question, you can go ahead now. Prue, if you want to ask your question. No, 
Okay, we might have lost Prue there. That's right, John. We've still got plenty of questions typed in, so I will. Well, Prue might come back, back later. Yeah, I'd hate, I'll go. I hate, hate, hate Prue not to have an answered question. Sure. Um, so our next written question is: um, the additional feed of 0.6 kg is significant. The recommendation. Yeah, yep. Yes, go on. Can, sorry. Yeah, you're right. The recommendation is to feed this in the final week. How can this be managed when joining is 30 days, or for when for all for many properties where joining might be a bit longer? A very good question. Um, if we're using a ram effect mating, which we're not for this type of lambing, for a spring lambing, it's usually an autumn lambing, which parts of Queensland will do, and we certainly do over here. Um, we can do a ram effect and get pretty good synchrony. Okay, very good synchrony. Um, but this is again where the um, where the, the the scanning into cycles is important. Okay, so you basically split them into 17 days groups of 17 days apart. Okay, by scanning them into their two cycles. So and and that's where that's how people have used that tool there. Um, Look, you, you, you're not going to know when every ewe is going to lamb. Um, you get a variation in pregnancy. It's even influenced by the um, by the the rams. We know the pole dorsed ewes mated the pole dorsed rams are always lamb a bit earlier. Often I can't say always, but often lamb earlier. So you've got a spread in gestation, probably from 145, 146 days to 153. Um, your twinners tend to be a little bit earlier, so more around yeah, 146, uh, 150. Um, so you've got to spread there. Um, so really what we do is, and I do have a strategy, a whole um, program strategy that if you're doing this uh, a, a February onwards mating, adjoining, sorry, uh, when you would start feeding and you count out from the number of days the rams are going in, um, all those sort of things. Um, but that, that scanning can certainly help, scanning them into first cycle or second cycle. The big ones obviously would get um, be put separately, and, and, and it does fit with the need for management with twin bearing ewes. You don't want too many twin bearers lambing on top of each other. And if you scan them into cycles where they're fairly close, synchronised, uh, not synchronised, but they're fairly close in their, in their, their um, when they're going to lamb, then you know, you've got to make sure you've got them spread out. That's the thing, is spread them out for lambing. Don't have them on top of each other because that's where the problem comes. This lamb stealing is a big issue. Does that help? Cool. No, that's good. And just following on on from that, I mean, I think you might have. Oh, sorry. Just been. on the 600 grams. Look, we we're certainly pulling back from that. Um, you know, when you do experiments, you want to make sure you get a result. We didn't know where to start, and uh, we we certainly it depends on what your base feed is, really. Okay. Uh, in our experiment, the base the base feed was loosened, loosened char, um, which is not over the top for energy. And um, and and so um, certainly, um, look. I know that, you know we 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 if you go too high and you've got a good base feed, uh, they're already getting some of that extra feed from their base feed because they can you know they're eating enough. Uh, or if you're supplementing, certainly some of them will be. And this is where we've had problems with mastitis, just pushing the udders too far, just getting them so big they they down basically. Down, basically. Thanks, John. So um, that's something you need to do. The other point, which I probably need to, re what I'd like to reiterate, there is vaccination. Make sure you use a fully vaccinated against clostridial diseases, because um, yeah, that um, all those things. Because you are getting more starch being delivered into the small intestine, and that's a lovely feed for those clostridial bugs that like to cause pulpy kidney. Yeah. Following on from that question, and I, and I think you you might have sort of answered it by the fact that you said you know you should be scanning it and splitting them into into those two two groups. But the question is, if the feeding period is extended to capture as many ewes as possible that are in the last week of pregnancy, then is there a risk of dystocia? Uh, probably not with twinners. You know, you've probably had to set them up. Earlier in pregnancy and really have a big placenta. I, yeah, look, I have experience in my own use. I've had to pull um, big twins and ultrafine merinos. I do feed them well, 
because uh, I want to know who's genetically fine, not nutritionally fine. I'm not interested in nutritionally fine wool. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, you, you, you know, if you pushed them all the way through pregnancy, and that's why that sometimes coming back, it's just not feed the hell out of them. It's, uh, it's feed, them, feed them sensibly, and that condition score three is really a great benchmark. Um, so if you had them at 4-4, four, four, um, score 4 through, through from, from when the Rams went in um, and held them there, um, because you thought you were going to do the right thing, you may well end up, and then you pushed them with this, you could well push them over and end up with some very big lambs, 7, 8 kilo lambs, even in twins, particularly in older ewes. So, but, um, yeah, the biggest issue is, I find, is getting the scanning wrong and getting singles in with the twins and overdoing them. You do run into a problem because they, you, you're feeding them for twins and she's only got a single. And so she, she, the, that you will put it into that lamb because it's, it's, it's got it. And, and um, if you've overfed them, you end up with big lambs and you've got dystopias. So it's critical that first of all, before you even think about scanning them into cycles, the scanner gets that right. He should be able to get dries right. But he's got to be able to get singles and twins. And it comes down to the point of, of, of how you did the mating that, or how you did the joining. The, the scanner's got to be understand what you've done, how long you've made, uh, how long you've made those used for, and generally in 35 days they can do that quite well. Um, but if you're just leaving the rams in and, oh, well, we thought we'd pick up some late ewes, well, yeah, well, you might as well be running ferals. Cool. Thanks, John. Um, have you, do you know of any work or have you guys done any work about the dollar return on the, on the additional fees? Yeah, I did. Uh, whew, I'd had a paper some time ago, we gave a presentation on win with twins. And, yeah, it's certainly um, in the prime lamb game, particularly here in WA, you know, except for the past few years where the prices have been pretty pretty horrible, um, the, um, the lamb, for prime lambs even, um, certainly uh, it, it, it's, it's been a very good return, uh, particularly when grain prices haven't been that, that high. Normally we'd be saying you don't feed for more than three weeks, um, particularly a lot of our guys are autumn lammers and they're coming into the green feed anyhow, so they don't have to feed that more than that. Um, your situation could well be different, but the bottom line is you've got to have live lambs to make any money. And I just find this loss of twins is, is a real, it's a real loss, economic loss, because you know, you've, you've compromised your wool cut from that ewe and then she loses the lambs and she could even have tender wool if she really gets into trouble. So all those points is, is, is and that's why the, the key message, I suppose, is, is feeding them appropriately all the way through. And, and if, if they're not in that really good condition score, that score three at lambing, and they need a hand, well, here is a strategy that can be used. Thank you. Um, on the point of lambing, when the use requirements dramatically increase, is there any difference between a maiden use energy requirement and a mature use? Uh, maiden, basically, energy requirements, is you first of all, you've got to get, understand you've got to meet maintenance first. You get no production until you've met maintenance. And maintenance requirements is based on body weight. So that maiden is going to have a lower maintenance requirement and then the, to, 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 to meet her demand, generally she is going to have a single. So she won't need quite as much because she has less required for maintenance. So she's got more available of what she's eating, more of the energy available of what she's eating is available for production. And generally she's only got a single. Does that help that question? Yep. Now that's good. What's the best method of feeding barley or grain to lamb and ewe? Look, we found lick feeders have worked exceptionally well in the right hands. The, um, the only thing silver about lick feeders is their colour. They're not a silver bullet. You've got to put effort into training sheep, and we found it works exceptionally well if we've got ewes, um, small paddocks, uh, sorry, small mobs, in, in, in paddocks where they can go up in the bush and, and, um, and, and, um, and privatise and, and have their lamb and come back and get back on the lick feeder. Um, they basically, if you've got 
a lot of use there and you've scanned them into their groups or you've got a fairly tight synchronised mating um, with the lick feeder, um, they're going to lamb around the lick feeder, particularly if the paddock's not conducive for them to go away. Ideally what you want is them to come in, have their feed, go away, have their lamb and not come back for another day so that the others aren't on top of them and they're not stealing lambs and all that because that, that can be an issue. If, uh, and, and, and training them is the big part about training them is knowing the food is there. So it's setting up the right environment and then being trained to the lick feeder to know the feed's there and you start early. Just get them onto it a bit earlier, a bit earlier, like, you know, make sure they're all onto it and taking it. Um, because if they're not, one of the things we've done to check out who's not eating and who is eating, we put a blue dye, that, uh, well it's a dye that's on the feed grain and when it gets, hits their muzzle, when they go to the feeder and get their uh, mouth against the grain, it, it comes up a, a blue colour. So we can cut them out and do it early so you're not, you know, you don't want to bring in pregnant twin bearing ewes into the yards, otherwise you'll have, um, you know, you'll have a lot of ketosis on your hands or, 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 or um, preg tox. Um, thanks, John. Just following on from that, is there a, a recommendation as to how many ewes to a feeder? Um, I, I, I think in many ways many people have had too many um, ewes on, on the feeder or not enough feeders, but I think also I'd have to preface that with um, having the right type of paddock where the animals could actually um, come in. But yeah, a lot, look, my clients who are working, getting it working well, probably 100 ewes. Uh, on a feeder, um, particularly if they're um, mated to a ram effect mating and they've got a fairly tight natural synchrony um, uh, and, and you find those, you know, a lot of the twins they seem to conceive first so when they're scanned out you've got a lot of them and so a lot of them are going to be lambing in a very short space of time so you don't want them all at the lick feeder uh, at the same time. So having a paddock where they can get away and that so generally we come back to about 100 per lick feeder. But look, in other environments, once sheep are settled and they're going out and grazing and, and um, all those sort of things and they've got themselves into a pattern, you could probably get away with more on the feeder. Yep, okay. We've got three more questions and then we might um, finish up there. So um, still another question on the lick feeder. Is the lick feeder with barley in it leaving you open to acidosis issues? Well, again, they need to be adapted onto it. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. In twin bearers, um, less likely of acidosis because uh, when we did the work with that uh, that um, paper there uh, in the table, when we did that work, we also did single and twin bearing use the single use as well as twin bearers. The singles got acidosis on the barley, but not on the on the on the corn, uh, whereas the twins didn't get acidosis on either, and certainly not on the barley. Now the thing is. In the twin bearer, she's got that compression of those eight legs pushing against the rumen from her in, that are in the uterus. They're pushing against the rumen and they're actually reducing the volume of the rumen and so the grain gets kicked out a lot faster. So it hasn't got time to get fermented. And you feed the grain whole um, so that you, you know, it takes time for the enzymes to attack it. It's not cracked up um, and um, consequently it's getting kicked out of the rumen. And you do need to feed roughage with it because that churning around in the rumen, they can't eat a lot of roughage because they've got a lot, of, a lot of lamb there, but that churning around with the fibre does help to, the stimulation of rumen motility does help to push that grain out. So um, the other thing is, is start early, um, provide some hay, um, put some bicarb with the uh, grain if you do. Uh, need to, if, uh, uh, but limit them on the lick feeder. That's the beauty of the lick feeder. You can lick, limit them on them and get the rumen adapted, the rumen bugs adapted so they can handle any lactic acid that's produced. Um, and they shouldn't be, you know, having big gutfuls of it um, because they're just licking away at it. And if you've got roughage there, they'll chew their cud, they'll put in the bicarb from their saliva and they'll help neutralise the acid anyhow. And that roughage will do the other job. So all these things really are little little synergies, I suppose, to make it all work better. Yep, cool. Two final questions. Um, what you've been talking about today, can that be used for accelerated lambing systems? And if so, are there any sort of um, provisos, I guess? Well, accelerated lambing systems is, you know, there's a couple of 
issues. I mean, we talk people talk about three lambings in two years. That's you know physiologically or reproductively possible. Um, the, the, the whole thing about any of this is, you, we've talked about meeting their nutrient requirements, they're holding them in score three, you really do have to have control of nutrition because we've got that, um, that, that, that stuff that falls out of the sky, doesn't always fall when we want it. So you really got to have nutrition under control. So you've got to either have the stored feed or whatever if you're going to do those things. Um, look, it, it, it does have application all the way, all those sort of things, but you're going to you know, there's a lot more strategies you can put in place for that, and I've, I've got clients actually doing some of these things. Um, another, if you really want to get excited about, um, you know, accelerated lambings, I mean, you use the STAR system that um, um, Doug Hogue put together at Cornell in the US years ago. Doug did a did a sabbatical with us at UWA, um, and quite an exciting system. Basically, you've got five points on a STAR, and you divide that into 365, so you've got a use presented to lamb, uh, rams every 70, there are some use presented to rams a flock every 73 days. Not that they're getting pregnant every 73 days. Can't change biology, but that is a system. And um, I think you, you can certainly Google, um, just go in and put Google star system, lambing system or something if you're interested in it. But again, you've got to have absolute control of nutrition. I wouldn't be recommending it for merinos. I wouldn't be recommending him lambing three years in two in, in a lot of the environments I'm sure you people are in um, uh, with merinos. Um, but this, the beauty of a merino is that they will mate outside the breeding season. You know, and what we're doing with a spring lambing, they're obviously conceived, they're obviously mating in the breeding season in autumn when you've got your you know declining day lengths. Um, but the merino can be tricked into uh, breeding outside the breeding season. So, you know, we find the marina a wonderful model for a lot of our, our work in reproductive physiology. Cool. Thanks, John. Uh, a general question to end up with. Um, mm -hmm. Over the lambing period in spring, um, what would you recommend feeding in Queensland? Um, in spring, well, uh, first of all, you know, when you say spring, is that August, September? Yeah, somewhere around there. Say September. Probably August, September. You probably aren't going to get the early breaks range yet. So you, what you really, you know, ideally, in the ideal world, and it never is, uh, would be some good winter rain and some good herbage, uh, button grass and all those sort of things. Unfortunately, uh, or if you, you know, if you have, if your uh, Michelin flinders have uh, we'll respond. That'll be that'll be great as well. But um, some good herbage is very hard to beat. Particularly on good sunny days, it's making the sugars. The, the lambs are going to get the sugars out of the feed. They don't, you know. I mean, if some years obviously have experienced those good lambings in the last few years. Um, um, but uh, I suppose the key is until that rain occurs, you've got to feed them, and you've got to feed them well, and to feed them appropriately. It doesn't mean overfeeding. It means to feed them appropriately. And I hope that's what you'll be able to take away from. Some of this from today is, is more that appropriate feeding. Um, you do have to meet that high energy demand, and that means if you're hand feeding, it means some grain, and and it can mean quite significant amounts of grains, like seven, eight hundred grams of grain a day, um, in concert, six, seven hundred grams of grain a day, in concert with with some hay, a good bush hay, and probably a lick. Um, there, there, there. That's um, you know, and if you've got grazing out there, uh, dry grazing, that's going to obviously um, may well just meet the maintenance requirement, but the, the, the all the supplements have got to meet the production of the milk, the demands for milk production, which is you know the big part of it. Cool. It's, it's a bit hard to give specifics, but you know, um, I think um, basically you've got to utilise your dry feed resources, but don't forget these ewes have got lambs. You know, uh, lambs on board, they can't walk a long way, they're carrying a lot of extra weight, and so the actual maintenance requirement to go out and graze is quite high. Um, well, it's increased because of, you know, they're carrying this big body around, um, some of which is water as well. And, um, but once they've got rid of those, la got those lambs on the ground and they've got, they're walking around following them, that's when they can go out and graze. So you really do have to look after them in that last, Last part of pregnancy, that last month in particular, particularly those twin bearers, know who they are, identify them, 
get that um, extra tucker into them, get the lambs alive, get them on board, and then um, uh, once they're out, then they can utilise more of that dry feed and they can walk further. The only trouble is, there's an issue there as well as as they get, they can't walk too far from water because they're making milk and that becomes a constraint. So their grazing range is limited by their need to go back and get water. And also those little tackers, <laughs> they heat up pretty quickly and dehydrate. So, you know, um, you really do have to put a lot of thought into how, how you're going to manage them. Um, and um, in many cases, it, just for that shorter period, even if you have got dry feed out there, that shorter period of, of good supplementation sets them up well for later on. You'll get room and development in those lambs. They'll be able to go out and graze better with mum when they're four or five weeks old because their room is set up as well. And you'll just see them eating more and, 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 and all those sort of things. Cool. Thank you, John. We might wrap it up there. So, so just to finish that session, John, what would be the three um, highlights, the three key things that you would want people to take away from your presentation today? Oh, I, I really, um, I really feel that uh, the area that probably has been undervalued and, and really does need a lot of need more attention is that is that because many most of us are on some sort of genetic path and, and giving that all that necessary attention to the management to your maidens to ensure they are getting into lamb and they are rearing lambs. I think that's a, a, something where you can make those big gains. I know I've been able to do that with a number of my clients moved them from 50 to 60% lambing in their maidens up into the 80s and now heading into the 90s. Um, don't, don't expect to get them all in lamb. Um, we do a few other extra tricks which, you know, if you're synchronising them and, and that sort of thing using a, um, a ram effect and I've got a few fancy flip over ram effects and that sort of thing that can be used. But um, essentially this, if we're trying to stimulate them is it, um you know, we get rain, you get rain on your dry feed and all those sort of things, that, that stuffs it up. So you've got to be stuffed up the feed. Um, so you've got to be cognizant of all these issues and you may need to go in with supplements. So I suppose um, those maidens are your future genetics um, and if you're, going, you're on a path to make some genetic gain, you've certainly got to have maidens rearing plenty of lambs so you can select from within those lambs because only half are going to be female. And so you've got to be able to select from within them for your future breeders to continue that genetic path. That's the first one. Pregnancy scanning. Um, look, at, uh, you know, sometimes I know it can be hard to get scanners, um, and sometimes early on early days, um, the, some of them weren't very accurate, which used to be rather a source of annoyance for um, singles getting in with twins and lambs. Put, use blokes pull it, having, well, people having to pull large lambs. A lot of the wives had to do it because um, they seem to get uh, um, lumbered with that job of checking the ewes. Um, and um, so uh, accurate pregnancy scanning, um, not just scanning for dries. Um, you know, people say, oh, I had a tough year, we'll just get the dries out. Um, still, you've got to get the other ones producing and you need to feed them in a tough year and, ra and rationally use your feed resources. Um, bottom line is to, with scanning is so that you know what you've got to handle. Um, you know what you've got to measure and you can plan, okay? Um, so I said failing to plan is planning to fail and, and, and we don't want to, you know, we're, we're, there's no prizes for a second. Um, uh, the other one of all this, I suppose, is, and you know, I'm sure they've had it before uh, for anyone who has attended workshops with uh, AWI sponsored workshops and that sort of thing, um, and, 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 and to me it's, it's absolutely right. But condition scoring is, is, is sheep. If you can't condition score, learn how to do it and do it. Uh, do it regularly, you'll get better at it, so that you can actually monitor how sheep are travelling. So that you can do these things to keep those sheep in the order, so that the, you are making sure that the feed is meeting their need and, and you're not going to let them down. Unfortunately, you can't recover a lost situation in biology. It's usually often too late because it's set in train and, you know, they haven't got the placenta set up because they were, you know, score two or less in, in early pregnancy, like, you know, soon after they made it, um, then uh, essentially if they did happen to get in lamb, um, then you're not going to get the placental growth. So pumping them at the end is not going to help either. Uh, well, it'll help a little bit, but it's not going to do the job it could have done. You wouldn't need to feed as much. So, again, that condition scoring 
as I say, it's a very cheap tool. It's already you carry it around with you most of the time, uh, and, um, and and so you use it. Cool. Thanks, you, John. So thanks everyone to John Milton for giving us some great tips on how you can feed and, and manage your ewes so they rear their lambs. Thanks must also go to the funders of this webinar, Leading Sheep, and thank you also to you for participating in our.